Section 2 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Siegel. The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1, by Anonymous. Translated by Dr. Jonathan Scott. Section 2. The Ass, the Ox, and the Laborer. A very wealthy merchant possessed several country houses, where he kept a large number of cattle of every kind. He retired with his wife and family to one of these estates, in order to improve it under his own direction. He had the gift of understanding the language of beasts, but with this condition, that he should not, on pain of death, interpret it to anyone else. And this hindered him from communicating to others what he learned by means of this faculty. He kept in the same stall an ox and an ass. One day, as he sat near them, and was amusing himself in looking at his children who were playing about him, he heard the ox say to the ass, Sprightly! Oh, how happy do I think you, when I consider the ease you enjoy, and the little labor that is required of you. You are carefully rubbed down and washed. You have well-dressed corn and fresh clean water. Your greatest business is to carry the merchant, our master, when he has any little journey to make, and were it not for that, you would be perfectly idle. I am treated in a very different manner, and my condition is as deplorable as yours is fortunate. Daylight no sooner appears than I am fastened to a plough, and made to work till night, which so fatigues me, that sometimes my strength entirely fails. Besides, the labourer who is always behind me beats me continually. By drawing the plough, my tail is all flayed, and in short, after having laboured from morning to night, when I am brought in, they give me nothing to eat but sorry dry beans, not so much as cleansed from dirt or other food equally bad, and to heighten my misery, when I have filled my belly with such ordinary stuff, I am forced to lie all night in my own dung, so that you see I have reason to envy your lot. The ass did not interrupt the ox, but when he had concluded, answered, They that call you a foolish beast do not lie. You are too simple. You suffer them to conduct you whither they please, and show no manner of resolution. In the meantime, what advantage do you reap from all the indignities you suffer? You kill yourself for the ease, pleasure, and profit of those who give you no thanks for your service. But they would not treat you so, if you had as much courage as strength. When they come to fasten you to the stall, why do you not resist? Why do you not gore them with your horns, and show that you are angry by striking your foot against the ground? And in short, why do you not frighten them by bellowing aloud? Nature has furnished you with means to command respect, but you do not use them. They bring you sorry beans and bad straw. Eat none of them. Only smell and then leave them. If you follow my advice, you will soon experience a change, for which you will thank me. The ox took the ass's advice in very good part, and owned he was much obliged to him. Dear Sprightly, added he, I will not fail to do as you direct, and you shall see how I will acquit myself. Here ended their conversation, of which the merchant lost not a word. Early the next morning the laborer went for the ox. He fastened him to the plough and conducted him to his usual work. The ox, who had not forgotten the ass's counsel, was very troublesome and untowardly all that day, and in the evening, when the laborer brought him back to the stall and began to fasten him, the malicious beast, instead of presenting his head willingly as he used to do, was restive and drew back bellowing, and then made at the laborer as if he would have gored him with his horns. In a word, he did all that the ass advised him. The day following, the laborer came as usual, to take the ox to his labor. But finding the stall full of beans, the straw that he had put in the night before not touched, and the ox lying on the ground with his legs stretched out, and panting in a strange manner, he believed him to be unwell, pitied him, and thinking that it was not proper to take him to work, went immediately and acquainted his master with his condition. The merchant, perceiving that the ox had followed all the mischievous advice of the ass, determined to punish the latter, and accordingly ordered the laborer to go and put him in the ox's place, and to be sure to work him hard. The laborer did as he was desired. The ass was forced to draw the plough all that day, which fatigued him so much the more, as he was not accustomed to that kind of labor. Besides, he had been so soundly beaten that he could scarcely stand when he came back. Meanwhile the ox was mightily pleased. He ate up all that was in his stall, and rested himself the whole day. He rejoiced that he had followed the ass's advice, blessed him a thousand times for the kindness he had done him, and did not fail to express his obligations when the ass had returned. The ass made no reply, so vexed was he at the ill treatment he had received, but he said within himself, It is by my own imprudence that I have brought this misfortune upon myself. I lived happily, everything smiled upon me. 
I had all that I could wish, and it is my own fault that I am brought to this miserable condition, and if I cannot contrive some way to get out of it, I am certainly undone. As he spoke, his strength was so much exhausted that he fell down in his stall, as if he had been half dead. Here the Grand Vizier, himself to Scheherazade, and said, Daughter, you act just like this ass. You will expose yourself to destruction by your erroneous policy. Take my advice. Remain quiet, and do not seek to hasten your death. Father, replied Scheherazade, the example you have set before me will not induce me to change my resolution. I will never cease importuning you until you present me to the Sultan as his bride. The vizier, perceiving that she persisted in her demand, replied, Alas! Then, since you will continue obstinate, I shall be obliged to treat you in the same manner as the merchant whom I before referred to treated his wife a short time after. The merchant, understanding that the ass was in a lamentable condition, was desirous of knowing what passed between him and the ox. Therefore, after supper, he went out by moonlight and sat down by them, his wife bearing him company. After his arrival, he heard the ass say to the ox, Comrade, tell me, I pray you, what you intend to do tomorrow when the laborer brings you meat. What will I do? replied the ox. I will continue to act as you taught me. I will draw back from him and threaten him with my horns as I did yesterday. I will feign myself ill and at the point of death. Beware of that, replied the ass. It will ruin you, for as I came home this evening, I heard the merchant, our master, say something that makes me tremble for you. Alas, what did you hear? demanded the ox. As you love me, withhold nothing from me, my dear Sprightly. Our master, replied the ass, addressed himself thus to the laborer. Since the ox does not eat and is not able to work, I would have him killed tomorrow, and we will give his flesh as an alms to the poor, for God's sake. As for the skin, that will be of use to us, and I would have you give it to the courier to dress. Therefore, be sure to send for the butcher. This is what I had to tell you, said the ass. The interest I feel in your preservation and my friendship for you obliged me to make it known to you and to give you new advice. As soon as they bring you your bran and straw, rise up and eat heartily. Our master will by this think that you are recovered, and no doubt will recall his orders for killing you. But if you act otherwise, you will certainly be slaughtered. This discourse had the effect which the ass designed. The ox was greatly alarmed and bellowed for fear. The merchant, who heard the conversation very attentively, fell into a loud fit of laughter. His wife was greatly surprised, and asked, Pray, husband, tell me what you laugh at so heartily that I may laugh with you. Wife, replied he, you must content yourself with hearing me laugh. No, returned she, I will know the reason. I cannot afford you that satisfaction, he, and can only inform you that I laugh at what our ass just now said to the ox. The rest is a secret which I am not allowed to reveal. What, demanded she, hinders you from revealing the secret? If I tell it you, replied he, I shall forfeit my life. You only jeer me, cried his wife. What would you have me believe cannot be true? If you do not directly satisfy me as to what you laugh at, and tell me what the ox and the ass said to one another, I swear by heaven that you and I shall never bed together again. Having spoken thus, she went into the house, and seating herself in a corner, cried there all night. Her husband lay alone, and finding next morning that she continued in the same humor, told her she was very foolish to afflict herself in that manner, that the thing was not worth so much, that it concerned her very little to know, while it was of the utmost consequence to him to keep the secret. Therefore, continued he, I conjure you to think no more of it. I shall still think so much of it, replied she, as never to forbear weeping till you have satisfied my curiosity. But I tell you very seriously, answered he, that it will cost me my life if I yield to your indiscreet solicitations. Let what will happen, said she, I do insist upon it. I perceive, resumed the merchant, that it is impossible to bring you to reason, and since I foresee that you will occasion your own death by your obstinacy, I will call in your children, that they may see you before you die. Accordingly, he called for them, and sent for her father and mother, and other relations. When they were come, and had heard the reason of their being summoned, they did all they could to convince her that she was in the wrong, but to no purpose. She told them she would rather die than yield that point to her husband. Her father and mother spoke to her by herself, and told her that what she desired to know was of no importance to her, but they could produce no effect upon her, either by their authority or by entreaties. 
when her children saw that nothing would prevail to draw her out of that sullen temper they wept bitterly the merchant himself was half frantic and almost ready to risk his own life to save that of his wife whom he sincerely loved the merchant had fifty hens and one cock with a dog that gave good heed to all that passed while the merchant was considering what he had best do he saw his dog run towards the cock as he was treading a hen and heard him say to him cock i am sure heaven will not let you live long are you not ashamed to add thus to-day the cock standing up on tiptoe answered fiercely and why not to-day as well as other days if you do not know replied the dog then i will tell you that this day our master is in great perplexity his wife would have him reveal a secret which is of such a nature that the disclosure would cost him his life things are come to that pass that it is to be feared he will scarcely have resolution enough to resist his wife's obstinacy for he loves her and is affected by the tears she continually sheds we are all alarmed at this situation while you only insult our melancholy and have the impudence to divert yourself with your hens the cock answered the dog's reproof thus what has our master so little sense he has but one wife and cannot govern her and though i have fifty i make them all do what i please let him use his reason he will soon find a way to rid himself of this trouble how demanded the dog what would you have him do let him go into the room where his wife is resumed the cock lock the door and take a stick and thrash her well and i will answer for it that will bring her to her senses and make her forbear to importune him to discover what he ought not to reveal the merchant had no sooner heard what the cock said than he took up a stick went to his wife whom he found still crying and shutting the door belabored her so soundly that she cried out enough husband enough forbear and i will never ask the question more upon this perceiving that she repented of her impertinent curiosity he desisted and opening the door her friends came in were glad to find her cured of her obstinacy and complimented her husband upon this happy expedient to bring his wife to reason daughter added the grand vizier you deserve to be treated as the merchant treated his wife father replied scheherazade i beg that you would not take it ill that i persist in my opinion i am nothing moved by the story of this woman i could relate many to persuade you that you ought not to oppose my design besides pardon me for declaring that your opposition is in vain for if your paternal affection should hinder you from granting my request i will go and offer myself to the sultan in short the father being overcome by the resolution of his daughter yielded to her importunity and though he was much grieved that he could not divert her from so fatal a resolution, he went instantly to acquaint the sultan that next night he would bring him Scheherazade. The sultan was much surprised at the sacrifice which the grand vizier proposed to make. "'How could you,' said he, "'resolve to bring me your own daughter?' "'Sir,' answered the vizier, "'it is her own offer. The sad destiny that awaits her could not intimidate her.' she prefers the honor of being your majesty's wife for one night to her life but do not act under a mistake vizier said the sultan to-morrow when i place scheherazade in your hands i expect you will put her to death and if you fail i swear that your own life shall answer sir rejoined the vizier my heart without doubt will be full of grief to execute your commands but it is to no purpose for nature to murmur though i am her father I will answer for the fidelity of my hand to obey your order. Shir Ear accepted his minister's offer, and told him he might bring his daughter when he pleased. The Grand Vizier went with the intelligence to Scheherazade, who received it with as much joy as if it had been the most agreeable information she could have received. She thanked her father for having so greatly obliged her, and perceiving that he was overwhelmed with grief, told him for his consolation that she hoped he would never repent of having married her to the sultan, and that, on the contrary, he should have reason to rejoice at his compliance all his days. Her business now was to adorn herself to appear before the sultan. But before she went, she took her sister Dinarzad apart, and said to her, My dear sister, I have need of your assistance in a matter of great importance, and must pray you not to deny it me. My father is going to conduct me to the sultan. Do not let this alarm you, but hear me with patience. As soon as I am in his presence, I will pray him to allow you to lie in the bride chamber, that I may enjoy your company this one night more. If I obtain that favor, as I hope to do, remember to awake me tomorrow an hour before day, and to address me in these or some such words. My sister, if you be not asleep, I pray you that till daybreak, which will be very shortly, you will relate to me one of the entertaining stories of which you have read so many. 
I will immediately tell you one, and I hope by this means to deliver the city from the consternation it is under at present. Dinarzad answered that she would with pleasure act as she required her. The Grand Vizier conducted Scheherazad to the palace, and retired, after having introduced her into the Sultan's apartment. As soon as the Sultan was left alone with her, he ordered her to uncover her face. He found her so beautiful that he was perfectly charmed, but perceiving her to be in tears, demanded the reason. Sir, answered Scheherazade, I have a sister who loves me tenderly, and I could wish that she might be allowed to pass the night in this chamber, that I might see her, and once more bid her adieu. Will you be pleased to allow me the consolation of giving her this last testimony of my affection? Sheer, having consented, Dinarzad was sent for, who came with all possible expedition. An hour before day, Dinarzad failed not to do as her sister had ordered. My dear sister, cried she, if you be not asleep, I pray that until daybreak, which will be very shortly, you will tell me one of those pleasant stories you have read. Alas, this may perhaps be the last time I shall enjoy that pleasure. Scheherazade, instead of answering her sister, addressed herself to the Sultan. Sir, will your majesty be pleased to allow me to afford my sister this satisfaction? With all my heart, replied the Sultan. Scheherazade then bade her sister attend, and afterwards, addressing herself to Sheer Ear, proceeded as follows. End of section 2. Recording by Paul Siegel of Maynard, Massachusetts.